Okay, somehow for, I printed out my notes, but I forgot to bring them. So I'm gonna to have to read them from my screen. Okay. It's not ideal. Can't read it. Okay, so uh, So today I'm going to first I'm going to talk about the legislator. And then I'm going to talk about the government. More about the government than the legislator, but the legislator is also kind of important. Um, so um, I think so to understand both of these things, uh, I want to go back to those two steps that I keep mentioning. Let's see, where I got the two steps. So, um, so for remem remember for Hobbes and Locke. Oh. There's two steps to setting up the Commonwealth. So the one is like, agree to form a Commonwealth. And that has to be unanimous. And the other is, Choose the sovereign or for Locke to choose the legislative. Right. So, I mean, this is choosing who or what is going to be the supreme power in the Commonwealth. And that's done by a majority vote of all these people who just agreed to form a Commonwealth. And um, as I emphasized last time, according to Hobbes and Locke, this is basically the last thing that, I mean, unless this vote is a vote to, that there's going to be a democracy, meaning that the sovereign or the legislative is going to be the assembly of the whole people, unless, unless that's the outcome of this vote, then uh, this is the last time the whole people are going to vote. Again, according to Locke, there may be some exceptions, but normally it's the last time they're going to vote. All right. So, um, so I pointed out that that Rousseau doesn't exactly have these two steps because um, because they're both combined into one step. Right? That is, we can only agree to form a commonwealth by agreeing to all together become the sovereign. That is the legislative. Um, and as I was emphasizing last time, even though it's this is already kind of true in Locke, namely that the supreme power in the state only acts by means of laws. So the supreme power is the legislative power, but it can only give general rules. Um, in Rousseau, that's emphasized and made more consistent. So agreeing to become the sovereign is agreeing to give ourselves laws. Um, um, however, there is still another important step. So, um, and 
I mean, I could write this step this way. Choose the government. Now, I mean, um, there's actually, there's an ambiguity in this, what we mean by choosing the sovereign or choosing the legislative, which carries across to this one too. So like, in a way, this is similar to this. Um, you know, and so this obviously has to be unanimous. We're all agreeing to become the sovereign. This is going to be my majority. And we're choosing the supreme, not legislative, but executive power in the state. But the ambiguity I'm talking about is that um, there's a difference between choosing what kind of sovereign or legislative power we're going to have. Is it going to be one person or many people? Is it going to be elective or hereditary or by lot? <laughs> um, uh, right? We have some government functions that are by lot in this country, namely jury duty, which is pretty important, right? Like our jury, the, the people who actually uh, decide on guilty or innocent in a jury trial are chosen by lot. <laughs> it's a little more complicated than basically. Right. So, um, but anyway, like we can choose all those things, but then, well, I guess, unless we choose to do it by lot, <laughs> we then have to decide who's going to, who's actually going to do it first. Right, like, you know, we decide we're gonna be a hereditary monarchy. That's one decision. And then we have to decide who's gonna be the first hereditary monarch. And that's the other decision. Um, and similarly here, when I say choose the government, there's a kind of ambiguity here about what's going on. Are we deciding what form the Supreme Executive power is gonna take? Or are we deciding who's gonna be it? So, um, and like both of those decisions have to be made. But insofar as the sovereign can do this, it's only going to be the first one of those decisions. So, we're going to see in the reading for next time how, like, this obviously creates a difficulty that Rousseau is going to address. But, you know, choosing the form of the government is making a law. So, the sovereign can do that. Choosing who is going to be, who's going to take the office is not making a law. That's a particular act. So the sovereign can't do that. Okay. So like I said, we're going to talk about that next week. So for now, I'm talking about choosing the government in the sense of making what Rousseau calls the political laws. Right, this is according to the classification of laws that he gives uh, at the end of book two. Um, book two, chapter 12. He calls these laws that are gonna determine the form of the government, uh, political laws, so he, he distinguishes between political laws and civil laws. The political laws are the ones that are going to determine the form of the government. The civil laws are the ones that are going to apply to the relationship between um, are gonna apply to the relationship between individuals or between individuals and the sovereign. Um, and he says, it's not his business in this book to discuss civil laws. So he's gonna only talk about the political laws. How he came to make this distinction between political and civil, which as I emphasized before, right, 
This is just the difference between political and civil is just the difference between Greek and Latin. It should be equivalent, but uh, Rousseau is using it to make a distinction. Um, I didn't remember before that he does that. I don't know how that started, whether he's starting it right here or whether he has it from somewhere else. But in any case, I don't have more to say about that. I just pointed it out. Normally, civil is the equivalent of political, but Rousseau has now using it done differently. Um, but in any case, so he says that these uh, political laws could also be called <clears throat> fundamental laws or are off, often also called fundamental laws. But he says that's misleading because um, I guess he thinks fundamental implies that you can't change them without destroying the commonwealth. And he says, no, these laws are subject to change whenever the sovereign wants to change them. So, um, so in that sense, they're not fundamental. However, in another sense, they obviously are fundamental, namely, um, they need to be made before anything else can happen in the Commonwealth. Right? Like, I mean, whatever other laws we're going to make, well, maybe I haven't, I mean, they haven't explained enough about what the government does, but just, you know, from calling it the executive power, you understand that it's the government that's going to administer and enforce the laws. So until we have a government, like, um, um, the sovereign can make all kinds of other laws, but they won't be in effect until there's a government. So, um, so this has to be done right away, basically. When the Commonwealth is formed. And that um, lands Rousseau with a problem. Because who's going to make these fundamental laws? Well, in one sense, Rousseau's answer is obvious, right? The sovereign is going to make them. Um, but the sovereign is um, all the people assembled. And all the people assembled can't write a bunch of laws. Right? So someone has to propose a system of laws for the sovereign to vote on. And hopefully they'll be good laws and hopefully they'll be approved. But without someone taking that on, um, nothing's going to happen. So like Locke and Hobbes don't really address that problem when they talk about setting up the Commonwealth. Who's going to, who in the assembly of all the people is going to, you know, step forward and say, well, I think the form of government should be X, Y, Z. Let's vote. <laughs> But, um, but this is actually, but obviously it's pretty important. Maybe, you know, because they think the decision here is pretty simple. Whereas, as we'll see, Rousseau thinks there's many, many different options for how to set up a government. Uh, basically an unlimited number of different ways of doing it. Uh, as opposed to Hobbes and Locke, who, well, I guess, no, that's not really true. Locke also believes in the possibility of mixed governments, of course. According to Hobbes, the decision is pretty simple, right? I mean, it's either going to be a monarchy, an aristocracy, or a democracy, and those are the only choices. But for Locke and Rousseau, there's a lot more choices than that. So someone has to, like, set up a system and then, you know, present it to the people for their vote. Um, and that is the person that Rousseau calls the legislator. 
So I'm gonna, I guess I'm gonna erase all of this later. So, I mean, it's not a mistranslation. He really does say legislator, but uh, it's kind of a unfortunate choice of term, I think, because, or at least confusing, because um, the legislator um, doesn't have any legislative authority. Right, so this is not at all what like we normally call a legislator or like a member of the legislature, or something, right? So like someone who's part of the legislative authority in the Commonwealth, but um, but this person has no authority to make laws in the sense of you know making them become law. <laughs> this person um, really has no authority at all, right? It's just someone who happens to come along and say, here's some laws, why don't you vote on them? <laughs> right, they don't need any authorization to do that. They're, they're just in, as, as Hobbes you know, would put it, they're just giving counsel. So, um, um, however, even though this person has no authority, um, who it is and what they propose is very important <laughs> because uh, once again, the assembly of the people is just, I mean, there's additional problems here. Like Rousseau says that they're, you know, um, not having been shaped by the institutions of a good commonwealth, they're not like even qualified to come up with good laws. But, but that, that almost doesn't matter if that's true or not, because they, like, you know, like they can't just all, you know, they're not all gonna write the same thing. <laughs> they, they can't just all hold a pen together, right? I mean, so I, I guess like you can imagine a process of, I mean, I guess this is what the framers of the US constitution did sort of, where there's like committees and, you know, like different drafts are produced and whatever, but, so like Rousseau doesn't really consider that. He's just thinking, maybe he's thinking that would obviously produce a worse result, right? Like maybe in agreement with Descartes, who, you know, who says that like a plan that's that, that a number of people come up together is never gonna be as good as a plan that one person decides on. Um, but anyway, he doesn't discuss that possibility. He assumes that basically one person is going to do it. So, uh, um, so the model for this, as usual, is Lycurgus, the semi-mythical founder of Sparta. Right. So you know, Lycurgus. Um, according to the story, you know, resigned all authority in the state before he gave them their laws. Um, and Rousseau mentions that certain other uh, Greek cities supposedly had like foreigners write their laws for them. Um, uh, so it's some, so we're talking about someone who like specifically doesn't have any kind of authority. Someone doesn't even, in the case of having a foreigner do it, I think the idea is that this person doesn't even have a vested interest. They have no private interest in, in what happens in our commonwealth. Um, uh, he also mentions as models of this Moses, um, and uh, Calvin as legislator for Geneva. Um, and he mentions if some other like Roman and Greek people in various places. Um, So like, these are all examples of people who presented like a whole system of, at least according to the stories, right? <laughs> who presented a whole system of laws ready and finished 
and then said to the people, I mean, I guess you can kind of read this into the story of what's going on at Mount Sinai that, that presented it to the people and the people vote to accept it. It's actually a rabbinic story that, that God suspended the mountain over them <laughs> and said, um, if you accept it, good. Otherwise, here will be your grave. <laughs> But anyway, that's obviously it doesn't actually say that in the text. So it's not responsible for that. Uh, right. So um, so it's someone who comes from the outside who presents this whole series of laws. Um, the laws in all of these cases, Rousseau thinks the laws were pretty good. I mean, it's interesting that he that he says that about these people, even though they didn't set up the kind of commonwealth that Rousseau thinks is legitimate. Um, but I guess it was still good enough. You know, he points out how long their laws have endured or how many people are under them or whatever. Um, so, um, but, you know, it seems like all these people have something else in common, <laughs> which Rousseau uh, is careful to notice as well. Right, these are all, I mean, it might not be as clear about Lycurgus, but these are all like religious leaders. So Lycurgus also, you know, according to the story, had the authority of the Oracle at Delphi for his laws. Um, I've actually, possibly he only did that at the end of the process, I don't know, but in any case, um, so all these people present this set of laws in the name of God or the gods. Why is that according to Rousseau? Um, well, um, since the legislator has no power to legislate, they have to get the people to approve the laws. Um, but they won't, Rousseau says, normally be able to, to do that by persuading the people that these laws are good. Um, because, so this is book two, chapter seven on page 164. No, it's not, no, it is, no. Oh, this is a page number for a different edition. All right, hold on a second. I'll find it. Um, Right, it's on page 182, book two, chapter seven, on page 182. For an emerging people to be capable of appreciating the sound maxims of politics and of following the fundamental rules of statecraft, the effect would have to become the cause. The social spirit that ought to be the work of that constitution would have to preside over the writing of the constitution itself. And men would be prior to the advent of laws what they ought to become by means of laws. Right, so again, Rousseau is saying that, you know, that the legislator in setting up the Commonwealth correctly, among other things, is ensuring that the people who live under the system will come to have uh, um, correct political sentiments, basically. But we can't presume that starting out with. So, um, um, so he concludes, since therefore the legislator is incapable of using either force or reasoning, he's incapable of using force because he has no authority, right? So like if, you know, one of these people says, except my laws or else, people are gonna be like, well, or else what, <laughs> right? So, um, so incapable of using force or reasoning, the reason they're, they're capable of using reasoning, right? That is Rousseau's assumption is that all these people really uh, 
understood why their laws were good and reasoned them out. But um, but they're not capable. The reasoning won't work because the people are not ready to understand it. So um, therefore, he must of necessity have recourse to an authority of a different order, which can compel without violence and persuade without convincing. And that <clears throat> is the role of religion here, right? So that what Rousseau goes on to say on the next page. This is what has always forced the fathers of nations to have recourse to the intervention of heaven and to credit the gods with their own wisdom. Right, so he's saying that um, pretty clearly that all of these people um, really wrote the laws themselves, <laughs> but then said, God told me. Um, So, uh, does that mean that this that the Commonwealth has started by deception? Well, you know, in a sense, there is no deception, I think, according to Rousseau, because the law that's being proposed here is, um, at least from the point of view of the, the legislator who's proposing it, this law is the law of reason. They figured it out using their reason. So it is the divine law. I mean, it's, that is, it's the divine command to this people in these circumstances to set up the, the, the best government that reason can come up with for them. Um, so like, in a sense, God did tell them, but of course, in another sense, there is some deception here. <laughs> a lot of deception, because roughly speaking, that's not what the people think they mean when they say God told me. So I'm going to talk about this more uh, next week when we, when, or on Thursday, I mean, when we get to what Rousseau says about religion in general. Um, but in any case, that's all I want to say about the legislator for now. Um, are there questions about the legislator before I go on to the government? I think a lot of times people feel like this legislator figure is some that Rousseau is somehow contradicting himself because it's the, like this shadowy figure who's really pulling the strings. Yeah. So are you essentially saying that like the legislator can give out ideas for laws, but he can't legislate in the sense of like, make those laws, like, or like act like actualize those laws and make them like in effect. Right. That's like the people's job. Yeah. But then God, like, at least with Moses, if Moses received God's word in the form of those the commandments, then isn't, I, I, I feel like there's like a weird, well, so that, I mean, again, leaving aside that rabbinic story I was talking about, the, um, I don't know how far to go into details of biblical interpretation here, but, you know, but according to the text, it's a covenant and God says, you know, like, um, here's my laws, well, you know, will you accept them and be my people? And the people say, yes, we will, you know, we will hear and obey. So, um, so like, I mean, there's different ways of understanding that. And I think that rabbinic story in, like itself points to some tension about how to understand that. But the way Rousseau is understanding it is that, you know, like um, it's a divine, it's a conditional divine command. If you accept it, this will be your law. Okay. And the people accept it. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I mean, whether he can also read that into these cases, I don't. I don't know. I don't know enough about it. <laughs> uh, but um, yeah, details of those cases to say. Um, all right. I mean, although 
Well, no, I shouldn't even speculate. All right, so I'm going to go on. I, oh, I, I, I was, there was something I was in the middle of saying, though, which is that, yeah, so, I mean, I think, um, like, this is, this legislator is not like a person behind the scenes who's controlling everything or something. Right, I mean, what, as Rousseau says, this, this can be and maybe ideally should be a foreigner. Someone who's not who's going to leave right after proposing these laws. <laughs> not, none of these people did that, but did Calvin live in Geneva? I don't know. But anyway, <laughs> um, none of these people, you know, did that. But Rousseau says, in principle, maybe that would be a good idea because, yeah, this is this person is not supposed to be um running anything they don't have any power they just they're just proposing something i mean there is something sinister about it however but that's the point i just touched on namely that apparently they only get their proposal accepted by a certain amount of fraud <laughs> right but um i guess i should say one other thing, which is that Rousseau gives a long list of qualifications that should have to be met to be a good legislator. And when you put them all together, they're like, um, uh, it would be a miracle if there was a person like that. And in fact, this, I mean, this is another respect in which I think Rousseau says that it's not, or implies that it's not exactly a deception, right? He says the true, the true miracle is the great soul of the legislator, <laughs> right? In other words, when they say, like, accept my laws because God told me, and how can you know God told me because of the miracles he's performed? They are the miracle. <laughs> it's so unusual. <laughs> but in any case, so but he does say, like, yeah, it's like it's very unlikely that anyone will meet these qualifications, which again is why there's so few well constituted commonwealths, or part of the reason. Um, I mean, there's other reasons too. He says that people have to be in exactly the right stage of their history. I th I think, you know. Yeah, he's thinking that that like very a very strange combination of historical circumstances and the right person being on the spot have to happen for this to go well. Okay, but now I'm going to talk about the government. So, um, So to understand what the government is, first of all, I want to go back to the distinction I talked about last time between the sovereign and the state. Right, this was the way, this is what Rousseau defines in book one, chapter six on page 165. Um, the public person formed thus by the union of all the others, takes the name of Republic or body politic. He doesn't mention Commonwealth, but I think he could have put that in too, which is called state by its members when it is passive, sovereign when it is active. And the associates are called citizens insofar as they are participants in the sovereign authority and subjects insofar as they are subject to the laws of the state. Right, so the, so the sovereign is, the state and the sovereign are the same people. <laughs> but the sovereign is those people as citizens making laws, and the state is those people as subjects obeying the laws, hopefully. <laughs> anyway, subject to the laws, right? So the sovereign is active and the state is passive. The citizens are active and the subjects are passive, even though every individual is both a citizen and a subject, <laughs> right? That was that picture I drew last time of the person, you know, the individual kind of in between and they, in which there's two different ways you can look at them. Okay, but this time, 
We're talking about a different kind of intermediate. Um, so um, this is how uh, Rousseau describes, first describes the government. Even it's even before he def he introduces the term government. Um, it's again in chap in book two, chapter twelve, on page one ninety. And this is it's his description of what the political laws are going to do. The action of the entire body acting upon itself. That is the relationship of the whole to the whole or of the sovereign to the state. And this relationship, I, I mean, this is one of the relations to consider in, set, in setting up a commonwealth. The action of the entire body acting upon itself, that is the relationship of the whole to the whole or of the sovereign to the state. And this relationship, as we shall see later, is composed of relationships of intermediate terms, right? So the political laws are gonna, are gonna regulate the relationship between the sovereign and the state. And the reason I say he's introducing the government here is because he says, and this relationship is gonna be composed of intermediate terms. And the intermediate terms are the government. Right, this is, so when he does define the government in chapter one of book three, on page 192, he defines it as an intermediate body established between the subjects and the sovereign for their mutual communication and charged with the execution of the laws and the preservation of liberty, both civil and political. So there's something that mediates between the sovereign and the state. Again, even though the sovereign and the state are the same people. Um, um, so whereas the stuff I was talking about last time kind of suggests Kant, this kind of suggests Hegel, if you're familiar with that, but right, that somehow, um, um, in order to be complete, the same thing has to be related to itself by an intermediary. <laughs> That's basically the whole principle of Hegel's system. So, um, but again, Rousseau is introducing it here in a very specific context. Um, and, uh, you know, without those really difficult to understand, to th understand things about the nature of identity and being as such, right? It's just, um, it's just about how this group of people can make laws for themselves and enforce them. It's gonna take an intermediate body. So why is an intermediate body necessary? Um, Well, um, so again, remember the subject have the subjects have agreed to obey the sovereign only insofar as the sovereign makes laws. Um, that is, they promise to agree to obey themselves, regarded as citizens, only insofar as they make laws. Um, so um, the sovereign as the people as a whole really only have the ability to issue commands to the state, that is to the people as a whole. If everyone were to get together and reach a decision by majority about some individual case, um, Rousseau said, uh, 
that would just be a matter of like a, a large group of people ganging up against a, a, a single individual. Um, there's no freedom, there's no legality in that. No one, no one agreed to that and no one should agree to that, right? I shouldn't agree to let a whole bunch of people gang up on, on me and decide things for me. So, um, whereas like according to Hobbes, that's exactly what I should agree to. <laughs> but Rousseau says, no, I shouldn't agree to that. I shouldn't give up any of my, I have to give up any of my liberty to enter the Commonwealth. So, um, um, whereas, you know, uh, when the sovereign makes, uh, issues a command to the state, there's no ganging up of anyone on anyone. Everyone's giving a command to themselves. Um, so, you know, this is, I'm just kind of going over again here why the sovereign can only give general commands. Um, but of course, the law has to be applied and enforced in individual cases. So the sovereign can't just rule by itself. Right? I mean, the, so the sovereign would just be I mean, I think, you know, I, I guess I'm, maybe I'm not saying anything I haven't said before here. I mean, even when I was talking about Locke, but it's still like, it's, it's important to, to see how, how fundamental this problem is, according to Rousseau. The sovereign, you know, uh, um, can say like, no one should take anyone else's stuff, but the sovereign can never say, a took B's stuff, so A should be punished. And so the sovereign can't apply the law, can't say, okay, this is a case, A took B's stuff, and also can't enforce the law, can't say, and so this is what will happen to A. And without that, the laws, without someone to do that, the laws have no effect. So, um, so there has to be another person, and it could be an individual or an assembly, but, um, or it could be more complicated than that. But in any case, there has to be some legal person who's going to apply and enforce the law. Now, um, It, it can seem like, and this is the way uh, Locke definitely seems to think of it. Um, and Rousseau sometimes sounds like this. It can seem like, therefore, this intermediation is one way. The government represents the sovereign. So like the sovereign is the general will, and then the government does what the general will says it should do. Um, now, I mean, that's true according to Rousseau, but it's not um, everything the government does. <laughs> um, it's, it's really, um, what the government does, does is really two-way mediation, I think, according to Rousseau. And that's certainly what he says in that paragraph I just read on page 192, they're, for their mutual communication, right? They both need, both the state and the sovereign need the government. So how does that work? Well, um, you know, in, in so far as the government is applying the laws, determining what case falls under the laws, the government is, is like serving or representing the sovereign. So I think it's in that sense that Rousseau and on page 192, he calls the government the servant of the sovereign and he calls the magistrates who are the individuals who are part of the government, the officials or, or officers of the sovereign. Um, but on the other hand, he also says, this is actually the first thing he says about the government, also on page 192, 
Therefore, the public force must have an agent of its own that unifies it and gets it working in accordance with the directions of the general will. So the public force, so like now we're talking about enforcing the law, I think, right? Like applying the law is just a matter of like seeing if this is the kind of case the general will intended. But enforcing the law means that I have to bring the collective force of the, of the public, of all the people to bear on the individual, I mean, or threaten to bring it to bear on the individual. Um, so that's so so like one thing the government is doing is like actualizing the rule that's been set by the general will. But another thing the government is doing is concentrating the force that's going to be used to enforce the general will. And the force, so Rousseau actually has a complicated metaphor. Uh, Right, because like he starts book three with this thing about um, how every free action has two causes. The one is moral, namely the will that determines the act. The other is physical, namely the power that executes it. When I walk toward an object, I must first want to go there. Second, my feet must take me there. Right, so this is something about the relationship between the soul and the body. Now, I mean, uh, I don't know that Rousseau has a worked out like metaphysics of the relationship between the soul and the body, but he certainly sounds a lot more like Descartes than Hobbes. This is a, like, it's a dualistic picture. So, you know, there's like the soul reaches a decision and then the body has to do it. I mean, does this necessarily imply that he really is a dualist in the sense that Descartes is? Well, I think, you know, looking at this picture, you could see, well, maybe or maybe not, right? I mean, it's, these two parts could be the same thing looked at from two different points of view or something like that. Um, but in any case, be that as it may, he clearly, he connects the force with the body and the will with the soul. Um, and he says that, um, the government accomplishes in the public person just about what the union of soul and body accomplishes in man. Right, so the government is putting the force and the will together. Or, I mean, well, there's what's analogous to the government is the unity, something that connects these two together. Um, that's just the thing that's mis so mysterious in Descartes, actually. What is it that connects the two things together? <laughs> it's like the pineal gland, and then there's the soul, and question mark, question mark, right. But anyway, so um, um, so that's a kind of metaphorical way of explaining why the force would be associated with the state, with like the people as passive, as the thing that should obey, right? Whereas the will obviously is the sovereign. So we're thinking of this, unlike, in Hobbes' materialist picture, the, the soul was the sovereignty, right? It was like this kind of abstract fact about the, um, the public person, whereas the sovereign was compared to the brain, a material item that actually pulls the strings. Um, but in any case, uh, in, Rousseau is comparing the sovereign to the will, or that is to the soul, and the state to the force, that is to the body. 
Um, but okay, so I mean, that's a metaphorical way of, of seeing why the government, what the government does has to work both ways. Like on the one hand, it has to, you know, um, it has to uh, convey the will from the soul to the body that the body has to command. But on the other hand, it has to like present the body to the will as a sing single thing that can be commanded. So um, that's the metaphorical way of understanding it. I think more literally, um, to understand it more literally, you have to remember that, you know, so when you set up a sum commonwealth, the subjects are, first of all, agreeing that they're gonna obey the laws that they make as citizens. <clears throat> but they're also agreeing, um, and without this second agreement, the first agreement wouldn't, would have nothing to base itself on, would not be um, reliable. They're agreeing not to interfere with, and if necessary, to aid in punishing people who break the laws. I remember how important that was in Hobbes and Locke, really, right? That when, you, when I joined the Commonwealth, like the, the liberty I'm giving up is the liberty not to punish or not to aid in punishing someone who the um, Commonwealth says has to be punished. Um, so, like that first agreement to obey the laws kind of sets up the sovereign will, but the second agreement, like to lend my force to the enforcement of the laws, sets up the state, the force of the state. And um, just like the, the, the general will would be no good without someone to apply it to individual cases, the general force is going to be no good without someone to um, uh, direct it to individual cases. To like gather it together. As, as he said, the public force must have an agent of its own that unifies it and gets it working in accordance with the directions of the general will. So the government is both representing the sovereign and representing the state. It's both like expressing the general will and expressing the general force. Um, that's the best I can explain this. I feel like it's still not as clear as it could be. Are there questions about that? No questions? <laughs> All right, well, I wish there were because like I said, I feel like it's not as clear as it could be, but oh well. Um, so um, so that's, what, that's why we need a government. Um, but uh, that doesn't tell us how the government should be set up. So again, like according to Rousseau, there's only one way to set up the sovereign. Everyone is the sovereign, but there's no such restriction on the government. This could be any kind of person who's given this authority. Um, um, so, you know, it can be, it can consist of different numbers of people up to and including everyone. Yeah. So are you trying to say with the government thing that the, st that the, for uh, the state as a force also like the government permits the state a certain extent a will? 
that like the sovereign has and then vice versa? No. I, I think that, I mean, I think the best way to understand it is the government makes the state something that is like capable of responding to a will. Um, um, I mean, maybe I should say it even, but now I'm afraid, I mean, if I do, I'm afraid I'll get into like, well, let me just say what it is before I say why I shouldn't do it. <laughs> but like, to, I mean, maybe I should explain even less abstractly, right? The like, you know, uh, if the sovereign makes a law, and then suppose the government only works one way. So the government says A has broken the law. And then what's supposed to happen next? Like, We'll just hope a mob will form and, and punish A. <laughs> right? Like um, uh, that's not that's not an act of the state, even if it happens. Right? That's just like the people who were around there and felt angry or whatever decided to punish A when they heard the sentence. But instead, we want the state as a unit. We want the state as the unit to as a unit to apply its force to accomplish the aims of the general will. And so for that we need a government, right? So the government says, you know, um, okay, we've determined that A has broken the law. Now we need to figure out like who is going to punish A, how much, and whatever. Um, and in that way. The, the state as a whole is enforcing the law. I mean, it may become a little bit like, again, I haven't talked about, and I mean, Rousseau is gonna talk next time about how that second question I mentioned about the government, who actually will it be? Like who will be the king or whatever? How, how the people also do that <laughs> and when we see that answer, I think hopefully this will become a little clearer what I'm saying here. But I mean, it's uh, yeah. I don't know. Did that help anyway? Yeah. Yeah. I'm I'm starting to think about Neoplatonic theories of the organization or whatever, but I'm not going to talk about that. All right. <laughs> so um, um, right. So, you know, there can be a difference in how many people are involved in the government. That is how many magistrates there are. Um, um, so establishes this other terminology of the government versus the prince, and the prince is composed of the magistrates, and the magistrates are the like obey the government, and the, but you know without getting into all those details, that you know there can be more or fewer magistrates, but also there's a question about like how the magistrates are themselves going to be arranged, right? So like. This is also a public person, assuming it's not a single individual. And it's going to need, like, again, a way of making decisions for itself and a way of enforcing the decisions on its members and so forth. So there's, in general, there's going to be an internal structure of the government. And also, it seems like, I'm less clear about this, but it seems like Rousseau also thinks that the government has like an external structure in the sense that, so within the government, there can be like different layers, so to speak, but also the, the government has like, as a whole, then like has, you know, officers who represent it. So it's like, I mean, you can think of it, think of the difference as something like this, like imagine the government 
is an assembly and the assembly elects a speaker, right? So that would be like this internal structure. So the speaker like serves at the pleasure of the assembly that elected them. Um, but on the other hand, imagine that the gov this assembly of the government now like appoints a bunch of police officers. So I think those police officers are not magistrates. They're like working for the magistrates. Um, so uh, anyway, be it as it may, um, I mean, that, like I said, that last part, I'm not sure about, maybe he doesn't make that distinction I was just making, but, in, but even without that, there's endless possibilities for this being very complicated. So, but Rousseau says, um, um, I mean, I guess like another way to make this, you know, like there's the question of how the government is imposing order on itself versus the question of how the government is exerting its power externally to itself. That was the distinction I was just trying to make. But in, so in any case, Rousseau says, there's lots of ways of doing it, but the one way will be the best way under the circumstances. Um, of course, the circumstances might change. Rousseau says, right. So if the circumstances change, the political laws should change. Right, so like if, to, if the legislator came along and found the people in a state where the best government for them was X, Y, Z, but then years later, the people realized that things have changed and X, Y, Z is no longer the best form of government for them, they should change it. Um, there's some danger involved in doing that, obviously, right? I mean, actually Rousseau ref refers to a series of incidents in the history of Rome that involved the, the danger of doing that, right? Where they appointed certain people to propose new laws to them. Um, and those people started to like take power to themselves. Um, but, but on the other hand, like there's no alternative. Circumstances have changed, we have to change. We can't keep with the worst form of government for the new circumstances. So like then Rousseau says a lot of stuff about um, exactly how the best form of government might depend on the circumstances. Um, including this kind of quasi-mathematical stuff about the, the total power that the government will need. Um, so, I mean, he said, this, is the, this is the stuff that's, of everything he says that's most interesting to me, uh, although, um, maybe is the least believable but it's <laughs> interesting so it's like it's based on these these things that he lays down so the first one on page 193 the less relationship there is between private wills and the general will that is between mores and the laws I'm not sure what he means why but anyway, the less relationship there is between private wills and the general will, the more repressive force ought to increase. Therefore, in order to be good, the government must be relatively stronger in proportion as the populace is more numerous. Right, so it's like, um, um, as the population grows, each person, has less and less share in the sovereign authority. So there's less and less connection between the sovereign will and the will of any individual. Um, so in general, more force is gonna be need to keep, needed to keep the individual in line. I think that's what he means. Um, 
right? I mean, you can imagine that if there were just three of us and we reached a decision about what the general will is, you know, most likely uh, we pretty, you know, like at least two of us voted for it and are, you know, are completely on board with it. And the other person, pro you know, like whatever, we're, I don't know. I'm not sure if I can make this more believable or not. Um, but that's one kind of mathematical principle he states. And then the next one is, this is right afterwards on the bottom of page 193. The more force the government must have in order to contain the people, the more force the sovereign must have in its turn in order to contain the government. So he's saying like, as the population grows, each person has less share in the sovereign authority. Therefore, more force needs to be brought to bear to keep them in line. But since the government is going to need more force, it's going to take more force to keep the government in line. <laughs> so it's like, although this is, so I mean, this is, he, he says it's like a continued fraction or a ratio. Um, like, where n is the number of people. <laughs> so, um, like, uh, as the government, as the population gets bigger, this ratio should get bigger. Um, but on the other hand, as the population gets bigger, this ratio should also get bigger. So um, like to find the optimum solution, so to speak, we take, we, we set them equal to each other. Um, Can you make better sense of that mathematically than I just did? Because, you know, I mean, the reason I'm saying this is because those two principles he gave, you know, I mean, all they say is, well, no, actually, maybe I can say it better. This has to get bigger, but in, so this has to get bigger to keep the individual in line. But this has to get exactly as much bigger to keep the government in line. <laughs> so these two things always have to be equal, is his claim. Now, I mean, he admits right away that there's no room for like geometrical precision in, in this type of thing. And that there's many like factors besides the size of the population that are gonna enter in and whatever. But he, so he says, I'm just giving this as an example, kind of like how to think about this. And you should probably just think of this as meaning like, you know, as the population increases, the power of the government is, have, gonna, is gonna have to be somehow suitably adjusted. <laughs> to keep it strong enough to keep the people in line, but not so strong that it can take power away from the sovereign. Um, you know, so he says, you can imagine someone ridiculing this by saying, oh, I see, so just solve it. So M equals the square root of M. <laughs> and now you have the, right, but he says, no, no, it does not, like, I don't, it's not that precise, whatever. But so, I mean, that's one issue about it. But the other issue about it is like, I wrote M, I guess M could stand for magistrate. Like, does M mean the number of magistrates? So um, this is confusing, but I, I think the answer is no, definitely not. The reason it's, well, let me show you why the answer is no, definitely not first, and then sh say why it's confusing. So in chap book two, three, chapter two, on page 196, top of page 196, 
since the total force of the government is always that of the state, it does not vary. Once it follows, now, so already this is confusing, right? If the total force of the government is always that of the state, you can't adjust the, for the power of the government. So, I mean, I think he means the power of the government on its own behalf, so to speak. The total force of the government is entitled to command is the force of the state. But the government as a corporate entity, the magistrates all put together, has some amount of force that it can exert itself without needing the rest of the state. That's what we're talking about adjusting here. And that's also what he's talking about at the top of page 196. Since the total force of the government is always that of the state, it does not vary. Um, whence it follows that the more of this force it uses on its own members, well, actually, so that I means so that's not what he's talking about on top of page 196. On top of page 196, he's talking about the force, the government using the entire force of the state. And he's saying, whence it follows that the more of this force it uses on its own members, the less is left to it for acting on the whole populace. Therefore, the more numerous the magistrates, the weaker the government. So, I mean, right? So first of all, that argument itself is a little bit confusing. Um, I guess the point is that like if one of the magistrates gets out of line, the, they, ha they have to be punished by the government. And the way they're gonna be punished by the government is by using the, like the entire force of the Commonwealth, not just the government's private force. Um, so, um, Um, so therefore, like the, um, the need for the government to control its own members is like occupying part of the force of the state, which could otherwise be used on everyone else. The thing is, I mean, if there's more magistrates, there's less everyone else, right? <laughs> That's why I don't quite follow this, right? Like every, you know, because suppose this is the entire state and these are the magistrates. So he's saying, if you have take more magistrates, the state still has the same force, but now more of it has to be applied to the magistrates. So there's left for everyone else. But there's exactly as, you, the number of everyone else has gone down by exactly as much as the number of magistrates has increased. <laughs> yeah. It just sort of brings into mind, it's like, um, like, you know, barbers cut people, barbers cut people's hair, but like who cuts barbers hair, right? Or, you know, maybe kind of like <laughs> That's not exactly the way it goes, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> the barber cuts everything. Yeah. The barber shaves every man in the village who doesn't shave himself. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, no, but I don't. Does couldn't the force like the force of the state say that stay the same even though the number of people is decreasing? It's just that the force of the individual people is greater. And no, so but what I'm saying is he's saying the government is weaker now because it has more magistrates, so it's using. But it hasn't increased its force because its force is always a force of the whole state. So it has more magistrates, um, uh, but still the same amount of force. So it has to use more of that force to control the magistrates, right? To like hold its own members in line. And so there's less left over to keep everyone else in line. But like I said, I don't understand that because. Yes, there's more magistrates, but there's less other people. <laughs> and 
I, I think, uh, I mean, it seems like, I think he just hasn't put it carefully enough because it feels like there, there is some argument. Like, I mean, it, it's, I understand why it, it seems true that if, like, if you make the government everyone, it's going to be weak. <laughs> but couldn't the, I have no idea. I'm just yeah, like guessing. But couldn't like the central government, or like the part of the government that is in the center, kind of act as the sovereign, and then the other magistrates are like, in a sense, their own states, and then the like. No, no, no. The sovereign is everyone. Remember, it's always important yeah. to remember that in no, Minnesota. I, yeah, can can't, can't the central part act as the government? Yeah. Yeah. Well, but then, like a greater group, I don't. <laughs> I mean, maybe somewhere a lot around there is an is an is an argument for this. Yeah, but since, but you know, since these people themselves are going to have to have a an internal like government government, and it's going to be smaller and. Yeah, but I, I don't know. Anyway, the, like the only argument Rousseau makes is the one I just quoted from the top of page 196. Well, actually, he may actually make some other arguments from it based on experience a little further down. But the only like abstract argument he makes is on the top of 196. And I just read you the whole thing. And it, it doesn't seem to be right. But in any case, so like the conclusion, so it seems like actually, you know, these, this M which represents the power of the government. So the power of the government will have to go up as the square root of the population, so to speak. But that doesn't mean the number of magistrates are gonna go up. The number of magistrates are gonna go down to make the government more powerful. And that, at least does match what Rousseau says. So Rousseau says that that for uh, uh, that a democracy and right notice now what a democracy means. So like um, um, Democracy doesn't mean that the sovereign is the whole people, because the sovereign is always the whole people, according to Rousseau. Right? So democracy means that the government is the whole people. Or actually, Rousseau has a looser definition. He says democracy means that the government is the majority of the people. Right, that is, he's allowing that something can count as a government, even if actually not every subject is a magistrate. But if there are more magistrates than there are non magistrates, he's going to call it democracy. I don't know if anything hinges on that. It's just a terminological thing, I guess. I guess. I mean, yeah, I mean, I, there's some real question about what is the, what is, what's the significant place to draw the line? And I think, you know, if Hobbes say, Hobbes implying that, like, if we have a commonwealth where everyone except two people are, are part of the sovereign, then uh, that's an aristocracy. And if we have a commonwealth where only two people are part of the sovereign, that's an aristocracy. <laughs> it seems like maybe this is a better place to draw the line, but I don't know. Anyway, so de democracy is where the government is most of the people. Um, and wait, why was I talking about that? Because, um, um, Why was I talking about that? I'm saying, oh, right. So Rousseau, whereas monarchy obviously is where the government is one person. 
one individual. And Rousseau says that democracy is a form of government best suited to very small commonwealths, whereas monarchy is best suited to very large commonwealths. So that seems to indicate that, that I'm right, that what, you know, what this M doesn't stand for the number of magistrates. On the contrary, this M will get bigger as the number of magistrates goes down and vice versa. Um, although, right, I guess this makes sense though, but whereas the total force of the state does get bigger when there's more people. Um, 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 sorry, that was a text I had to respond to. Um, all right, so uh, in general, Rousseau says, so um, in general, Rousseau says, this is not a good idea. Um, Right, I mean, we could do this. So if we do this, then all three of these people will be the same, <laughs> right? Like the state will be, or sorry, the sovereign will be everyone acting as the general will. The state will be everyone acting as subjects to the general will. And the government will be everyone acting as the government. <laughs> so there'll be three different legal persons, but they'll all be the same composed of the same individuals. Um, so, um, why is this a bad idea in general? Um, so, I mean, there's various reasons. Um, and, you know, I mean, Rousseau points out, as I guess everyone does, that this kind of pure democracy would be, uh, you know, impractical. I mean, I guess a lot of other people would also say that Rousseau's view on the sovereign is impractical, <laughs> that no law can be made and accept in an assembly of the whole people. Um, it wouldn't work in a very large state, obviously. It would only work in a pretty small state, a pretty small commonwealth, um, like maybe like a Swiss canton or something. And maybe that's what Rousseau is thinking, but he is Swiss. <laughs> I mean, Geneva was not that kind of small canton, but in any case, um, uh, but Rousseau says, you, you know, Rousseau thinks he has examples even from the history of Rome and Sparta, how this, this part can work. But he says having the government be every, everyone is just, you know, because that would mean that the, like since things could come up any time, the people would have to always be assembled, right? Like every time there was like, uh, you know, um, police call or whatever, all the people would have to vote what to do. <laughs> So he says that's, you know, that's not practical, but I think there's a deeper reason why it's not a bad idea, um, which is that as Rousseau agrees with Locke, it's a bad idea for the same person to have the legislative and the executive authority, um, even when that's a corporate person. Um, but maybe it's not exactly the same reason, though. This is the reason he gives. This is on the bottom of page 198. 
Book Three, Chapter Four. Nothing is more dangerous than the influence of private interests on public affairs, and the abuse of laws by the government is a lesser evil than the corruption of the legislator, which is in the inevitable outcome of particular perspectives. So what he means by that is that, right, so in this form of government, the people are like assembled all the time, but for different reasons. They're assembled to make laws, but they're also assembled to apply and execute the laws. So when they're making laws, they're supposed to think of expressing the general will. Uh, I mean, that is, um, they're not supposed to think of any individuals or the, any relationships between individuals, but then they have to like change hats <laughs> immediately and act as the government. And then they have to make all kinds of decisions about individuals. So Rousseau says that kind of constant changing hats is gonna corrupt them. They're gonna, when they, when they go back to making laws, they're gonna be like, still thinking about how it will affect individuals rather than how it will affect the whole. So, um, so it's actually like, um, tends to, the problem with this is that it, it tends to corrupt the, the legislative power. It tends to make the legislators the, the people as citizens stop thinking about the common good when they make legislation. Um, so that's why he says that in general democracy, he's, in fact, he says there probably never has been a completely pure democracy. Right for in, for for him that would mean that like there's no there's no one who's like a speaker and there's no one who's like you know police or whatever there's just the assembly of the people does everything so like I said you know like if um, uh, if you have a traffic accident and you call nine one one the answer is Assembly of the people, <laughs> how can I help you? <laughs> like, so, um, but, but, um, but I think he thinks that as far as like, um, things have approximated in that direction, perhaps for a very, very small state, this might work out, but it's basically a bad idea. You shouldn't rely on it working out. On the other hand, he also says that monarchy is extremely unstable. And there's at least two different reasons it's, it's extremely unstable. So one is, so in, so in monarchy, according to Rousseau, the king is um, a single individual who is only supposed to, apply and enforce the laws. So they're not supposed to use the force of the state for their own advantage at all. Well, um, a person like that is subject to obviously to a very strong temptation. <laughs> Right. So like they're, they're always going to be trying to find a way to suppress the sovereign and take more power for themselves that they can use as they please. So that's one reason he says a monarchy is very unstable. So, right, so he, he means not what we usually call a monarchy, but this kind of legitimate monarchy that he imagines is very unstable because it's always trying to become what people usually call a monarchy where the king is the sovereign, <laughs> right? Where the, where the king arrogates to themselves the powers that should belong to the sovereign. So, this, um, so that's one reason it's unstable. Um, but 
he also says it's unstable because of the succession. Now, I mean, this is something a lot of people uh, mention about monarchy, and I've mentioned it too, that, you know, that the dangerous time for a monarchy is when the old king dies and we need to choose a new one. So um, he seems to assume, and this is the way like elective monarchies worked. He seems to assume that a new king will be elected only when the old one dies. Or maybe the old one can abdicate or resign and then a new one will be elected. But anyway, only when the office becomes vacant. Um, that is, he's not imagining that we elect a new monarch every four years or something like that. Um, so like given that assumption, I think we can see that he's right that this is going to be a problem. Um, and it's, I mean, the things he points out are, I think even Hobbes mentioned some of these same issues. It's not that original, but he says like, um, well, if you make it hereditary, then of course there's no guaranteeing that the heirs of the king that you selected will be good kings. No matter how carefully you chose the first one, the later ones might be terrible. But uh, on the other hand, if you make it elective, then there's so much at stake in this election that it's going to become violent, right? Because people are, it's either going to, that it's either going to become a mere formality and then we'll be reduced to really having a hereditary monarchy, or it's, gonna, it's going to become violent because people are, you know, we're deciding who's going to be the chief executive for life. <laughs> so, um, so therefore, for both of those reasons, he concludes that a monarchy is also in general a bad idea. Although if your state is very large, you might be forced into it. Um, but so if democracy is a bad idea and monarchy is also a bad idea, what's the best form of government? So, I mean, like, again, Rousseau thinks the best form of government depends on the circumstances. But in general, or just considered in itself, his answer is the best form is elective aristocracy. So the people elect certain aristocrats or like oligarchs, and those people are the government. And again, I'm not sure if they're elected for life or for a fixed term. But especially if they're elected for a fixed term, that's probably like the closest Rousseau actually comes to what we call democracy, like representative democracy. Um, so the people like elect a Senate and the Senate is the government. However, it's very different from what we call democracy because the Senate is only the government. It has no legislative authority. That's what he's saying is best. Um, um, on the other hand, what people usually call aristocracy, that is hereditary aristocracy, he said, is the worst, he says, the worst of all. <laughs> so, so, yeah, so, like, actually, when we rank these, we ask, is aristocracy, aristocracy. Anyway, this, I'm, I'm asking this somewhere. but anyway, is like is aristocracy better or worse? The answer is well, it depends. It's either better or it's either better than both or it's worse than both, depending on how it's set up. All right, I'm uh, out of time, so I will see you on Thursday.